morning, everyone. My name's Judy Anderson Firth. I'm the CEO at Euphemia, which is the family office for Aussie fintech entrepreneur and investor Dom Pim. And we're here to make awesome, make awesome in the Aussie startup ecosystem. Uh, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that we're meeting on today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to elders past and present. And I do think the meaning of place is particularly pertinent this week with everything that's happening in the global landscape and obviously sending out uh, respect to peoples all over the world who are having all sorts of challenging conversations. Um, so just quick introduction. So as I said, my name's Judy. I'm the CEO at Euphemia. I'm going to be our moderator for tonight's panel where we're talking about fintech for impact. Um, just a quick context before I introduce my esteemed and very distant faraway guests, uh, Cameron and Arj. Uh, so Euphemia, as I mentioned, is the family office for Aussie fintech entrepreneur and investor Dominic Pym. Dom is most well known for being the co-founder of Up. Uh, is anyone here an upsider? Yes, perfect. So if you're not an upsider, you can ask for my code. I'll get you five bucks for free. Um, so Up is Australia's most loved digital bank. Uh, and Dom built that business and sold it to Bendigo and Adelaide Bank at the end of 2021. And prior to that, he was also uh, the co-founder of Pin Payments, which he sold to um, Checkout in Europe, which is Stripe's number one competitor. Um, so kind of like the fintech guru, he was awarded fintech leader of the year three times last year. Um, twice by two different fintech peak bodies and then C-suite leader of the year at the Pause Awards. Um, so very lucky to, to be working in the fintech space with like one of the best fintech entrepreneurs and investors that there is. Um, we also invest in climate tech to try and help fix the planet, uh, in women-led startups or really any founder from a disadvantaged background who hasn't had equal access to opportunity and also in startup infrastructure, which is kind of like a niche corner of B2B SaaS where it's a high growth tech company who is customers are high growth tech companies. So that's us. We typically invest pre-seed up to series A and we're also in about 20 funds both here and abroad across pre-seed up to private equity. Um, but that's about all I'll say about me because the rest of the night is definitely about our panellists. We're going to be hearing from three fintechs across uh, the Australian fintech sector and talking about what it means to be a fintech who's in the impact space. Um, this isn't going to be a one-way conversation the whole night, so just in terms of what to expect, in terms of the format. So um, I'll introduce our panellists just so you know who they are and get a bit of a, a feel for the sort of bias they may be bringing to the world, the lens that they have, the, con the, the sort of customers and business that they have so you understand their context. We'll then have a bit of a moderated panel. I'm going to ask them some friendly questions, some curly questions. Um, and the goal for tonight is really to have a, a, a pretty um, honest and open conversation about what it means to work in this space. And then we'll open up for Q&A. So um, if you are curious about anything, um, you have a comment, you have a question, you have a proposition that you'd like to put forward to, to one of our founders, uh, just keep that in the back of your head. Uh, we're going to have a good 25 to 30 minutes for Q&A. So the second part of this night is really just going to be an open group discussion, you know, um, on the things that you really want to know about, learn about, or just hear people's points of view on. So hopefully what you walk away with um, from this evening is some very bare minimum, you know, the people that you meet in the room tonight are working in the same space as you. Like everyone here is clearly interested in fintech for impact. Uh, and then hopefully you get a new idea for your business, your team, your goals um, as, you're, as you're moving and working in this space. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to go uh, from left to right. So Arj, I'm actually going to start with you. Um, so Arj is the founder and CEO of Anam. Uh, any Anam followers in here? Perfect. Yes. A room full of new potential customers, Arj, which is great. Um, no pressure to sell. Uh, so Arj is a financial and investment executor. Um, I do love getting people's bios from their LinkedIn profiles because it, it tells you how they see themselves. Uh, so a financial and investment execu uh, executor, solution-driven practitioner, power networker, and he likes to get things done. Uh, he's helped businesses build in-house solutions for operational efficiency, so a bit of an efficiency nerd, and passionate about positive impact investing. Please put your hands together for Arj from an arm. <laughs> Arj, uh, so I think it's always best as well to have, you know, I can introduce you, but no one knows you like you. So um, could you please tell the audience a little bit about yourself, your background, and what the business of an arm is? Thanks so much, Judy. That was very kind. Um, I think I need to update my LinkedIn bio. <laughs> um, 
it's been a while since I wrote that one. But no, thank you so much. Uh, lovely to be here and to have this panel with such an incredible moderator and some great panelists. And me, myself, my background, super eclectic, born in India, raised in South Africa, based in Australia, um, typical third culture migrant entrepreneur. And passion has been very much around using finance and money as a tool to propagate positive impact around the world. Um, our mission at Inam is to redirect every single dollar of capital into impact. And we starting, we're starting off on doing that and securing that mission by helping young people that don't know how and where to invest to do so with an impact by embedding investment literacy throughout our app and allowing them to track their impact dollar for dollar. As a business, we then reinvest our profits back into the impact ecosystem to support women of color, people of color, and young people from disadvantaged backgrounds, both currently and previously, with access to capital that they otherwise wouldn't have to build the businesses of the future. So that's what we do um, in terms of you know my background. Uh, I, I come from the horrible world of investment banking, yay. Uh, management consulting and impact work across um, NGOs and NPOs in Africa, Asia, and Australia. Um, went into all those specific industries to learn about how they work so I can extract all of that and bring it to the rest of the world. So I will shut up now. Awesome. Should put that on your LinkedIn profile. Yeah, amazing. It sounds, it sounds a little bit better, <laughs> I think. Well, you're not old enough to have done all that. <laughs> exactly. Um, uh, speaking of people who are old, yes. um, so just kidding. Cameron and I have known each other for many years. That's why I can give him shit. Um, so Cameron uh, is a phenomenal entrepreneur. He's been working in the Australian tech sector since before startup was really the common phrase. Um, so he's the co-founder and director of Lend for Good and also Red Hat Impact. Um, so let's see how your self-description matches up with reality. So uh, he works at the intersection of finance, business, technology and startups. He's passionate about uh, transformation and the evolution of human systems. He's working on fueling the growth of the impact economy in Australia, APAC, and the rest of the world. Please put your hands together for Cameron. Thanks, Judy. Um, I think I did update my LinkedIn recently, so I don't have any don't have any excuses for those words. Um, you might have looked a bit deeper than the headline, though. I think is what I've been working on. Um, yeah, hi. It's great to be here um, and to be part of the panel. I've known known Arch and admired the work of Inam. Obviously, Judy and I. We're involved in the Awesome Foundation, and I love that you've now got this whole awesome thing going with Euphemia as well. I'm like, hey, keeping the theme going. Keeping the theme going. It's all about dinosaurs. Um, so if you if you need to know this code word to get in, um, just talk about dinosaurs. Uh, but yeah, um, as Judy said, I've been based in Melbourne for a while now, um, and Red Hat Impact is Melbourne-based, but a global innovation consultancy, and we're focused on how we make capital solve social environmental problems. That's really what we do. And we do that at an enterprise level, working with founders um, to help them understand what needs to happen and what kind of capital that they need to solve the problems that they're working on. But we also work for like um, large foundations and the government um, on doing much larger things. So one example of that is we've built a trade finance vehicle for Pacific menstrual health enterprises with DFAP. Um, so we make the capital solve a problem for them, which is that their stuff is what costs way too much to buy in the Pacific. So. That's the kind of work that we do there. And as part of that kind of how do we build, um, I guess, systemic solutions to this capital challenge around how we make capital solve problems, we co-founded Lend for Good with the Start Some Good team. And Lend for Good is a global decentralized impact lending platform um, that's about mobilizing the crowd, us alongside foundations and family offices and high net worth individuals to invest in impact enterprise founders both here and around the world. And so that's the perspective I'm bringing here. Um, the words that um, Arj used in terms of Inam and like, you know, trying to make every dollar contribute to impact, I guess that's kind of on the similar path that we are. Like, you know, how do we make capital do the job that we think it should be doing, which is making our world a better place to live as opposed to making people wealthy. Love it. And then I think some really useful things for context as well as like helping people understand like exactly where you are in your business journey as a founder, as a, as a you know, entrepreneur, as a leader. Um, so maybe just if you could both explain sort of like what year this current venture sort of began, uh, maybe give us like what you're comfortable to share in terms of like the scale of your operation. So maybe like headcount, revenue, your, or capital, right? Like what, 
give us give us a bit of a sense or like how many clients you might have like what sort of stage and size of growth where are you at in your journey uh as you might start with you yeah i think so inam itself is is still in the pre-seed stage as a startup um we've tech- checked all the boxes we needed to to get to as far as we could in terms of you know getting our regulatory licensing in place arrangements for that um we've built a database of over half a million people now who are interested and will engage with Inam once we come out and launch the product. We've built the prototype. Um, we've got a team of about six people and um, we're all kind of bootstrapping this all the way up, up until now and in the process of closing our fundraise. Um, we're in the process of closing our round at the moment and once that's done, we're looking at about a four month roadmap to launch after our fundraise closes so yeah still in the early stages but i guess inception wise the seeds were started sowing seven years ago the company was incorporated three years ago and now we've gotten to the point where we just need the capital to hit the road run and start making a difference awesome you can awesome um red hat impact we were seven years old in august um we've been building pretty slowly uh as a learning as we go and just putting further proof points down. We've now got five directors. Lena here has joined rel- the most recent director to join. Uh, so there's five of us within the business. Um, and we've been, I think the last count, we've worked with about 25 different impact enterprises over that seven year period. Um, about 65 loans we've facilitated, about $3.1 million that we've put into those, um, through those 65 loans into those uh, 25 companies. Um, Lend for Good then came along a bit later. We realised that we needed a platform, but we went, well, why would we build a platform for ourselves at Red Hat Impact? Let's build a platform for the world. And so that journey has been six years. Um, We incorporated in October 2018. Um, We've been down a few rabbit holes uh, along the way, as you do as a startup founders in terms of um, thinking execution strategies and pivoted a few times. But then in June 2021, we did a convertible note raise and we've been using that money now to build and launch our platform so we launched beta in january 2022 since then we've done 22 loans deployed 1.55 million bucks to across those 22 loans about a third of that's been repaid already two loans done Um, our team is five directors two staff and a bunch of consultants that we kind of pay to do different things Um, but yeah we're still we've got revenue we've $50,000 $50,000 with revenue we've earned so far, but we're still very much um, in that early stage and we're currently fundraising as well to kind of do our next power up so that we can do a billion dollars of lending a year is what we're aiming for now. Love it. Congratulations. Um, so if you were to explain to someone who had never been to a fintech event before, like what part of the fintech universe do you work in? Like how would you explain what your business is and what it does? Like the actual product, the thing, like what is it to a non-fintech person? Um, Cam, I'll start with you. It's it's an interesting question because I think at Lend for Good, like we're a platform and a marketplace, but we've never really seen ourselves as fintech in the sense, but I guess it is because it's about deploying money. But I think how we see ourselves is a movement, right? We're a movement that enables individuals and organizations such as ourselves to participate in loans to impact enterprises that need our support. So it's a, it's, it is, the, the technology that enables that is FinTech, you know, and it, it is about the movement of money, but we're not positioning what we're doing as a financial product that you can invest in to make money. Like, we want you to get your money back with the interest that the borrowers are promising you, but the whole point of being there is that you want the impact that these in- enterprises are delivering in First Nations communities in Australia, in Cambodia, you know, in um, the Maasai Mara in Kenya. You believe in that impact and you want that impact to happen. And so our product is, I want to, I, as an individual, I for people in this room, I'd be interested in supporting impact enterprise founders around the world and in Australia, understanding their business and what they do and contributing as part of a group of people to whatever it is that they need to achieve. Our product is is that. It is, I'm going to be part of a movement of people that's going to help these impact enterprises succeed. 
the fintech is kind of the tools that we use under the hood to make that possible and enable you to do that and to move the money around and to do the contracting and all that stuff. It's a that's the that's the how as opposed to the what, if that makes sense. Cool. And Aja, now what part of the fintech universe are you in? Yeah, I think very much resonate on the whole movement journey. And that's, I guess, the one thing that keeps us going every morning. But in terms of where we're at, in terms of the fintech world, we're the guys, the guy, the people that help you invest your money, make a difference, and grow your money at the same time. So it's kind of removing the barriers from being able to make investments that actually make a difference and that also provide you um, a financial return on those investments that don't come at the cost of doing good. Um, in most instances, actually beat market returns um, from doing good and also allowing you access to previously inaccessible markets. So as an Aussie citizen, you can typically invest in Australia, um, potentially the US. Uh, we allow you to invest in far more markets across the globe, more than five on day one, um, which is Australia, the US, um, the UK, Japan, um, and the UK. Um, those are those are the five, and Canada, sorry. So those are the five. So just we're the guys that help you increase your wealth um, in a way that still does good. You're able to track both your wealth and the goodness you've done in the world, and where th we then channel that back into the ecosystem, so. Thank you, Ash. And, uh, Welcome, Matt. You're looking Hi. remarkably dry for how late you are. Yes. I was expecting lots of puddles, lots of splashes. So um, I'll, I'll introduce you quickly uh, and then I'll, I'll let you introduce yourself. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, Matt is here from Virtual. So he's the co-founder and CEO of Virtual. Uh, so that's Australia's number one uh, crowdfunding platform, uh, equity crowdfunding platform, I should say. Uh, and uh, I've got a few things for how you describe yourself on the internet. Um, so you can tell me whether or not they're accurate. Um, an experienced financial services lawyer and entrepreneur, you can vouch for that. Um, private practice uh, experience from top tier law firms, but also founded several businesses, um, not shying away from a barbecue event. You can ask Matt about that. Um, and a recognized expert in the fintech regulation and crowdfunding space. Please put your hands together for Matt. Thank you. So Matt, maybe tell us a little bit about your background and the business of Virtual. Um, thank you, Judy. Uh, Virtual, Virtual's an equity crowdfunding platform. It's relatively new in Australia, but it's been a really popular way for businesses to raise capital, particularly early stage businesses overseas. The UK's probably got the most mature and developed equity crowdfunding market. Um, government started thinking about this around 2012, 2013. I was in private practice, um, saw what was happening in the UK and was really inspired by um, companies really opening up their, their capital raisings to uh, to the masses. And I remember speaking to partners that I was working for, like, have you seen what's happening in the UK? They're talking about it in Australia now. And people saying, it, you know, it will never happen here. It's, it's a risky asset class. It, it really shouldn't be offered to retail investors. And um, I just wanted to be involved. And um, I got talking to my co-founder, Alan, who um, had founded a, a reward crowdfunding platform. And... Um, over several years watching the development of the legislation and then uh, 2018 um, we launched and uh, the industry has really gone from strength to strength, particularly over the last few years. I think COVID was probably the first major inflection point for us um, because it's an entirely online process. You know, the old traditional ways of raising capital, pounding the pavement, pressing the flesh wasn't really possible and ours became really attractive for people. And and then even in the last 12 to 18 months, as you know, macro conditions have made raising capital pretty challenging. And you know, we've felt some of those challenges, but, but certainly not as much as other parts of the market. And um, I think companies are increasingly becoming aware of um, what we do as a great way to build awareness for what you're doing, build a community of supporters and get the capital you need to execute your plans at the same time. So... Um, from my days in private practice to, um, you know, now just working with founders every day. It's, uh, you know, really inspiring. As I imagine, you're inspired by your job too, Judy. So. Yeah, I mean, we're invested in virtual. So, yeah, I have to say yes. Very inspired <laughs> by the companies that we invest in. Um, and so just uh, I've asked this as well of, of Cameron and Aj. So just to help um, everyone understand like a little bit of like the sort of 
size of the organization, the sort of stage that you're at, like any metrics you're happy to share around like maybe headcount, you know, the size of your, your clients or um, capital raised or revenue, any sort of like just to get a stage of like, you know, where, where the business is at so far. Yeah, uh, the businesses that are using us. Uh, the virtual business. Oh, the virtual business. Um, we have about 25 staff now. Um, we've hosted over 220 successful offers, 175 million invested through the platform. Um, so it's uh, starting to achieve, uh, you know, a, um, you know, not in significant scale, but um, the Australian crowdfunding market on a per capita basis is the second largest in the world, but it's, it was the last one to be implemented among its global peers, so New Zealand, uh, the UK and, and the United States. Um, we're behind only the UK in terms of size, but the UK is still seven times the size of Australia's market. So it's a huge opportunity. Um, and, you know, there's, we have about 250,000 members on our platform, um, but we can make regulated offers of securities or host regulated offers of securities for companies that can target a national audience of investors and, you know, approximately 9 million uh, Australians that are active investors um, were really only scratching the surface and, um, you know, some amazing businesses have, you know, already had great success. Um, but I'm really keen to get into this discussion tonight because, you know, lots of businesses that are very purposeful, that have built a strong community, um, it has, you know, we've shown that uh, equity crowdfunding is, is, you know, perfectly suited for those kinds of businesses as well. Anyone in the room participated in a um, virtual campaign previously? Excellent. Yeah. Which company? Oh, yeah, excellent. We've been a bit quiet with the breweries this year, um, but we've got filter brewing. Uh, not advice, but yeah, consider the offer document. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, I feel like this entire panel needs that disclaimer. Yeah, like, yeah, you know, yeah. seek independent financial legal advice, etc. General information purposes only. Um, so, uh, we'd love to get into some of the, the some of the questions I've got for you to sort of yeah flesh out this topic. So, um, I'm curious to understand like when we talk about fintech for impact, you know, impact is used synonymously with good, with, you know, sometimes not for profit, with some, like, it's, it's used, used in a very broad way. Um, and so I just really like to understand, like, when we say impact, like, what does that actually mean in your business in practice? So, um, I mean, Cam, we might start with you. Like, do you guys have a formal definition for impact? Um, I think I'd, I want to answer that in two parts. Like, for Lend for Good, the impact that we are trying to have is on the way capital markets work. So our focus for our impact and our theory of change is that this missing middle and impact finance where we have, you know, a 5.2 US trillion per year gap in micro, small and medium sized businesses being able to access the capital they need, we need to change the way capital is thought of and deployed to solve that problem. So when we think about impact, it's like, are we making a difference to how people think about risk and investment and participation? that it opens up and helps solve that problem. So that's, for, for us, it's a kind of enabling macro level kind of impact that we think about. Um, but then when we get to this question about, well, who can use your platform? What does impact mean? Like, again, our analysis of the problem is that part of the reason why this missing bill and impact finance exists is because of the rules and definitions that people put around what is and isn't impact, right? And so for us, we're saying, well, fundamentally what it boils down to is a value proposition between the borrower who says, this is the kind of impact that I'm creating and that I want to create with your money and the lenders that says, well, I believe that story and I want to be part of that. And I'll give you two examples, right? Um, First Nations businesses in Australia. Um, previously, in my more ignorant younger days, I always thought, well, the, the a First Nations business needed to have an impact purpose for it to be an impact business, not just to be owned and run by a First Nations person. But I went to the Impact Investment Summit and I got into a great conversation with Leah Armstrong, who is the one of the founders of First Nations Capital. And she's like, no, every First Nations business, no matter what they do, is an impact business. Because our lens is a seven generation one and the impact that we're trying to have is self-determination autonomy for our people. And so every First Nations business is, that is started is about achieving that impact in a seven generation lens. And I'm like, you're right. And I don't get to judge that. 
And I don't get to choose whether that's impact or not because you are deciding whether that is, right? And so there will be impact investors that won't invest in First Nations businesses that don't have an impact proposition because they are not on board with that story. But then there are other, but there's an education process there about, well, no, it's not for you to decide, it's for up to First Nations people to decide what is and isn't impact. And the other example is I wouldn't think of a rubbish truck driving down my street as an impact business. But as soon as you go into some emerging markets, the fact that there is no waste management collection, <laughs> like it's a huge problem. People are collecting waste off the street with their bare hands and getting paid for based on stuff they can put. It's like creates a whole bunch of problems. So we have three loans now in a waste management business that's using the money to buy garbage trucks in Tanzania. And it's an impact business. And the impact they deliver around water uh, sanitation outcomes and environmental outcomes and healthier streets, I would never have defined that as a business that has impact. And so I think it's a real danger that we, as the platform operators, decide what is and isn't impact. We rather kind of say, tell your story about this and how it works. And if the lenders believe you and they want to be part of that, then they will. And as soon as you get to a stage of like 250,000 people, what people want to participate in is very heterogeneous, right? Again, it's, it's disingenuous for us to decide what they should care about. It's up for them to decide what they care about and how they spend their money. I'm curious to know, um, Matt, you're also in a similar position as a facilitator, right? Like as a facilitator of deals happening, you know, um, how has Birchall thought about it in a similar way, in a different way? Like how are you guys thinking about impact? Are you defining it and like setting rules for the companies raising money on your platform or is it sort of left more open for each of those companies to sort of articulate to your investors on the platform how they're defining impact? Yeah, it's um, I mean, your comments really resonated with me because we, we think about this a lot. Um, but as a starting point, a starting proposition, um, you know, we, it, you know, we enable companies to make regulated offers of securities. Um, so it's a securities offer. They need to, you know, present in accordance with the regs um, and, you know, a standardised way of presenting um, that investment opportunity. The way that we build audiences or help companies to build audiences for, for these is storytelling. And um, the ability to advertise these offers is one of the real game changers of the crowdfunding regime. Um, so naturally, craft breweries and other interesting businesses have done particularly well. Um, but we're getting, I suppose, increasingly um, concerned or nervous, particularly among um, you know, the, the discourse on greenwashing and so on, because many of these businesses um, describe themselves of, as having a purposeful mission and they're building a community and telling a story and building an audience on that. And I'm not suggesting that, you know, there's anything wrong in our, you know, portfolio or the businesses that we've hosted, but um, often it, it's pretty easy to make a lot of these claims when you're an early stage business. It's when you become a later stage business that you're actually faced with some real trade-offs. You know, as you become larger, um, you do need to make tough decisions. Um, so we've thought a lot about this because we feel that we're in a very advantageous position to drive good behaviour from the grassroots. And we haven't released any of this um, uh, yet, um, or implemented it rather. Um, but having a standardised way for people to talk about their purpose, defining their purpose, and then making commitments to people at the point that they're raising capital and um, you know, are, uh, are defining and articulating how they're going to measure their impact is something that, that we want to add. So there are no rules per se on this other than you know, um, guidance on, on being misleading and, and, and this is being added to um, all, all of the time. Um, but you know, it, it's definitely an area of focus for us because... Um, we can build these things into, you know, into offer documents. So companies are making, you know, firm commitments at the time that they're raising capital, which um, should help them because many of them, you know, have, um, you know, zero codes on a mission to untrash the planet and CBIM project cleaning up the world's waterways. Um, uh, but then, you know, others um, are less clearly defined, but they're still kind of... Uh, establishing this bargain with investors while they're building their audience and raising capital. So something we thought about a lot. It's definitely one of the big challenges. Like if you're a fintech and you're operating in any sort of regulated market, especially if you're anywhere near a license, 
you know, like the responsibility, you know, that sort of comes with that. And also the risk, you know, um, it, you know, regulations change and like what the focus of regulators are in terms of making sure things are nice and tight and, you know, um, investors are protected, you know, and they're there for a reason. And so I love the idea of embedding it in the product. So um, it's less based on the people, you know, it's actually just a part of the product and how it's released. Um, Arj, I'm curious, you are at that like starting end of the journey, right? Like being a pre-seed company operating in a highly regulated environment, like with the promise of impact investing. And, you know, I'm imagining there is a very high hurdle for you to cross when it comes to, you know, the promises being made to investors that everything is like an impact lens. Like how have you thought about you know, meeting those requirements, you know, um, like while still in the early days, you know, not yet having all the capital you need to really run at that opportunity. How are you navigating that? 100%. And I'm really excited to share this because this is something I'm very passionate about. So I think number one, I'll start with the challenges and then I'll start with, um, you know, how we're embedding it. The challenge is globally impact isn't standardized. Every country on the planet, every asset manager on the planet, and every other institutional investor on the planet has their own definition of impact. We have broad guardrails that we can use to define impact, but there isn't one uniform decision on what impact is or what it looks like. And that's not a problem, that's fine. What it does do though, is it makes it difficult to be able to, as Matt's already pointed out, and um, my incredible co-speaker next to me, who I'm going to pretend I've forgotten their name, but they know I haven't, um, is that that's the problem, right? Um, because that makes it so easy for people to say they're doing impact. And at this point, I want to make it very categorically clear that ESG is not impact. We all go around thinking, oh, we're doing good. It's ESG compliant. It's green. It's But that's not impact. Impact sits 10 to 20 steps ahead of that. So I think the most important part then in, to solve that problem is awareness, is education, is actually informing people on what edu what impact really is and allowing them to understand impact at a level that they can define it at. For us, I think impact goes without saying from day one. So we've developed our own impact management and impact measurement framework using some of the world's leading impact methodology. So Inam's investment portfolio is governed by the Impact Management Project, which is a global framework used by almost every asset manager as the base, which focuses on companies that either benefit the planet or contribute to solutions that benefit the planet. The first step of that is avoid harming the planet. I think we're well beyond that. The planet has already been harmed. We need to start looking at the other end of the spectrum. And we then obviously have you know, financial metrics that are assigned to the impact being created in terms of the team construction, um, the kind of people running the business, where the revenue lines are coming from. And the third kind of lens that we add on top of that is the management of those businesses. We don't want Harvey Weinsteins popping out of our portfolio companies. So we've got to make sure that when we're evaluating the businesses that go into our portfolios, we're looking at the management teams, the directors, the people running the show day to day to conduct whatever baseline psychosocial analysis we can to ensure that impact is carried through and through and is no longer a question. I often get asked, oh, Arj, will Tesla be in your portfolio? I'm like, is Tesla an impact company? No, it isn't. Um, the only thing green about that company is the battery that goes in the car. The leather still comes from cows. The, sh the chassis is still built from steel that comes from coal-powered plants. Um, the screens are built from cobalt from miners that are exploited in Africa. So no, yes, and that's the best example I can provide of where doing good isn't actually an impact investment. So yeah, I hope that answers your question. Uh, educating people and then providing them the empowering tools to be able to do that with a framework that we're transparent on and that we share with people. Who do you think will regulate this new high bar for impact? I know the UN is talking about doing it, but I have, and there are many financial regulatory bodies that try to, but there isn't a uniform consensus on who's going to regulate it. I think there is a necessity for it. But then we go on to Cameron's point, which is if we start defining it, then what about the people who are affected by it? You know, so. I'm curious. Like, I think with a lot of this, until there is that you know, universal or at least national for, for our region body that sort of starts to measure what impact really is. Because as we've learned just from this discussion, there's like a sliding scale, right? Like this very broad and 
very open to interpretation and also like a mix of like push and pull from your customers. Like in some of these instances, it sounds like your customers are pushing you there or you're taking advantage of the organic wave of impact that's coming through your business or in some instances, you're playing a more thought leadership role and sort of pulling those who aren't already there into that category because that's where the future is. Um, I'm just curious the role that then trust and reputation plays, you know, in your success in the FinTech for Impact space. I mean, Matt, I'm curious, like, you know, virtual, not just, you know, trying to build trust for impact, like you had to build trust and reputation for an industry that didn't exist and arguably was facing some force that it shouldn't exist. Like, how did you go about building trust, you know, because virtual is now recognized as like the absolute market leader. And I think like, yeah. Thank you know, you. well, I know the stats. It's like between like 70 to 80% market share every single quarter um, and sometimes 100% like pre pretty regularly. So how did you go from no one knows who you are and no one knows that this asset class should exist to being the market leader? How did you build trust? Uh, slowly um, and with with care and hard work. And um, there's like there's a bit of an origin story in this which is, is relevant to this conversation. Um, but I, I think we're a very purposeful platform. I think people see us that way because of the companies that have told stories and had success on our platform. But we, we could, I, I couldn't sit here and say um, that that was the plan. Uh, our first successful campaign was for a company called Park and um, they make soccer balls and they've got a really nice buy one, give one model um, like Tom's Shoes. And um, our first two campaigns were failures um, and we learnt a lot um, and you know I remember talking to Sam um, Sam Davey from Park and he was like I, I can't be your third failure like this really needs to work and um, we we got it done but it opened um, you know it opened people's eyes to what was possible for a business like Sam's and um, it's uh, I think then kind of defined um, our audience, particularly in the early days of people that perhaps couldn't find investors in, you know, the, the, the landscape of active investors in Australia, but saw actually this is a great way to raise capital and build a community around a purpose or a mission that, that I care about. And as a result, we've had lots of, lots of success. So um, we've become a purposeful platform because that's how people have seen us and I think that's what the community, you know, in the aggregate has um, has needed. Um, but it's important that, you know, we we don't sit in judgment and I don't think we should on, you know, which uh, ventures get funded and which don't. Um, there are certainly some um, companies, you know, that make us a little uncomfortable and we have a conversation um, about that and, um, I wouldn't say that there are any hard and fast rules necessarily that, that we have. We're working on, on them, some principles, but it's something that's evolved over time. And I think it's really important in the context of this conversation because, um, you know, a purpose that is meaningful for one person and one community um, might be counter in some respects to um, another community that, that something is purposeful for. And, you know, the question as to who regulates um, impact, I think it's it's better if it's if it's unregulated um, because uh, you know people should hold each other to account on this and um, be mindful of authenticity and, and and their reputation and the communities that they're that they're building and there should be structures that um, that allow for that to happen. I think a lot of this um, is being talked about in terms of you know. ESG and um, accounting standards are really going to kind of take a, a lot of the, the, the burden of, um, you know, some of these objectives. But when thinking about a company's purpose and why they exist and, and what they're going after and then how they'll measure their impact, um, you know, it's uh, not everyone will see things the same way. And I, th I think that's okay. It should be that way. I'm curious, um Cam, have you ever found in your in your years with the businesses, this one and previous ones, where you've had like an instance or an example where like trust has been eroded, you know, whether it's through your control or outside of your control and how did you overcome that? Have you got a, a story to tell? Um, I think I... I looked at that question earlier, so I've been kind of contemplating like, you know, what's, what's the story to tell here? And, you know... I, 
we haven't really seen that. And I think it's because, as Matt said, like in this space, like trust is the number one currency, right? Like if you lose trust. And so our approach has always been to focus on transparency and accountability. And what we have found is if you can if you can talk honestly with people and give them the information, it helps educate them. And they just don't, un, you know, there's things that they don't understand. They don't understand how stuff works. And so there's certainly been difficult situations with borrowers where, you know, them meeting their obligations has been challenging and they have not been able to on what they originally promised. But you just be transparent and explain, get the story told, like put them in a room together to talk to to talk to the lenders about well, this is what's going on. Because I think particularly in the sector that we work in, you know, you get into micro, small, medium, micro and small business, medium, less so, like life events happen <laughs> and that completely derails your business, right? It, it can happen and people understand that. You talk to it. It's, it's, if you go back, that's the relationship you used to have with your bank manager, right? Like the bank manager, you'd sit down and you'd talk to them about what's happening in your business and they'd understand and they'd figure out how to make allowances and stuff. And that just doesn't happen anymore, right? Because it's, it's all about efficiency, making money, systems, process, structure, and sorry, you fall outside that done like move on right and i think going back to that building relationships and, and trust and transparency i think is kind of fundamental to how you build trust you give people access and knowledge and information and relationship and connection um, to do that and i think we've been you know with red hat impact we took a very softly softly approach we did our you know we did I think it's also about eating your own dog food, right? The very first impact loan we did, the three people who founded our business did it. Like we said, okay, we're doing this one, we funded it. And then we can say to the next group of people, well, this one, we did. This one here, we'll do half of it, but we need you to do the other half. And so we could take people on a journey where we had skin in the game as well. And so you're finding those things, I think, continually about how you build trust and confidence and what are things to do. How you then begin to do that at scale, you know, which I think is stuff that you guys are grappling with about how, do, you know, when you've got that many offers coming through and that larger community, how do you provide signals to people about scale? It's something we think about as well. And I think where we with Lend for Good, our focus at the moment is how do we use platform dynamics and transparency to show that, where you can see the history, you can see... The hist you know, one of the ways we're solving that, you know, in the short term is the intermediary that works with a company like Red Hat Impact that supports impact enterprises. They have to propose a loan, not the borrower themselves. So you've got our reputations on the line here. And so you're kind of trading off third party reputations or skin in the game to kind of give shorthand kind of trust. But it fundamentally in that digital world, that's what you're, that's your only currency is that people believe the story. They believe that their money is going to come back to them or it's going to get used for the purpose that they contribute it to. And I think when we've been faced with challenges of that, we've just always erred to transparency and openness. And here's what's going on. Here's the information. Here's what you can do. Here's your options. And had that conversation and not shied away from stuff that can sometimes be really hard. And so, um, I mean, listening to both of your responses so far, it sounds like trust and reputation is really just like data, information, consistency over time. <laughs> like there's a formula, right? Like data plus time equal, and it's, if it's consistent, then that equals trust. Um, curious, Aj, how do you do that when you're missing the time element? I think that's a lesson I've had to grapple with of late. Um, and... I don't think there's a substitute for time, but I do think the substitute for being able to do and build trust with confidence is transparency. Um, it, it might give you a bit of a head start on the timing bit, but doing things the right way and owning up to when you fuck up is very important because when you're dealing with people's money, money is a very emotional subject um, no matter how pragmatic we'd like to be about it, no matter how financially literate we become, at the end of the day, almost 99% of our decisions related to money are driven by emotion. So if you stuff up with someone's trust in that instance, you have one shot. That's it. You're not getting another shot. So it's something we've had to grapple with in terms of, okay, yeah, we're young. Yeah, we don't have um, the benefit of time to leverage, 
in terms of how we build that trust. But the other way we tackle this is by being transparent from day one. And that's something our customers have told us they've wanted from day one. So how we build our portfolios, who we work with, what impact we are, you're making is available to you on day one. What we're doing with our money, where it's being reinvested is transparent on day one. So I think that and, and the other way of you know leveraging not having a lot of time is also just speaking to people and giving them what they want. I think as a society, we've somehow stopped doing that and giving people what we think they want. Um, it's really not that hard. Go talk to people and ask them what they want. And if you can give it to them, give it to them. Um, and say what the biggest other problem I have with trust and not having time is do what you say you're going to do. Don't say you're going to do something and do the complete opposite because that's the other way you erode trust, um, whether you have time or not. So, yeah. I'm just going to add to the transparency thing. And I think I'll be interested in your view, Matt. But I think what what I see that you do and what I think we do as well is you make sure there's people. Like there's people that faces there's people that they can connect to, that they can speak to and talk to as well. Like you don't want to be a faceless digital platform. You know, you don't want to be a disconnected abstract experience. You want them to know there's real people. And I think it's one of the things that Inam's done really well. In you particular, you've been out there and you've stood in front of people and said, this is what we're doing. And like when people go Inam, they go, well, I know Arj. And so I don't know Inam yet, but I know Arj and I trust him. And I think that, you know, I would imagine Matt, you're, years of experience in, in, in the sector would have led to, well, if Matt's doing this, then I've got some sense of trust in what Virtual's doing. Even though I don't know what Virtual's all about, I believe in Matt. And I think in the early days, it is our experience and who we are and putting faces there that can speak to people that helps people with that kind of trust and relationship in the early days. I don't know if would, that, that uh, your experience. I completely agree in, um, in, you know, guiding companies on how they will tell their stories and build audiences on our platform. It's all about that. It's authenticity. It's being someone that, you know, um, feels deeply about the mission that they're going to execute because, you know, I think someone needs to acknowledge a risk warning like six times before they can make an investment. And it says you're going to lose all of your money and people still invest. And it's because there is someone that they've had a connection with and, and they believe their story. So, yeah, I completely agree. Sets me up perfectly for a segue into a slightly different topic and then shortly we're going to move to Q&A. So um, if you've got any comments or questions on like what we've discussed so far around trust and impact and, you know, just the operating in a regulatory environment, just get them ready. We'll, we'll shift to that shortly. Um, but uh, I want to talk about partnerships and like collaboration because, again, like in so many of these events, like, you know, we wheel out the founders on stage as the representative for their organisations, but like you all know that it takes so many people, partnerships, projects that are full of collaboration to actually get anywhere meaningful. And so I'd actually just like to unpack like how your team and your business thinks about partnerships, if you've got any great examples of where that's played um, to your advantage. And if there's anyone in the room who is sort of maybe, like it's not their natural strength, you know, like if you have some like partnership 101 you know, any lessons learned, you know, from the hard knocks that you may have had in pursuing partnerships um, over the years, that would be really useful. So um, anyone's welcome to start on that topic. I might give it. <laughs> this is going to be fun. No, I think um, number one, recognize you can't do this alone. There is just no version of this when you're building something that you're going to be able to do it alone. Um, when you choose your partners, treat them like partners in your business instead of service providers because I think a lot of us tend to make that mistake. If you're paying someone for a service, um, they're a service provider. When you shift the mindset to treat them as a partner in your business, they have a sense of ownership associated with your business as well. And be prepared for the rainy days because sometimes partnerships feel great when they start and they're like, yeah, this is amazing, but be prepared for when they turn sour um and know how to deal with them because that's when you need to shift back to okay you're not a partner anymore you're a service provider and i've got to deal with you pragmatically uh but afford afford that luxury to the right partners and i guess that's just something you learn over time and when it comes to your customers and the partnerships you make in terms of you know what matters to them and what resonates with them make sure that you're not greenwashing or virtue signaling because 
we live in a pretty smart world. People can catch on to your bullshit. Um, don't do things that allows them to. Stay true to who you are. Don't pretend to be something you're not and partner with people that resonate with that. Um, not for the sake of, you know, partnering with people. So, yeah. Matt, Cam, anything to add on the topic of partnerships? Um, we, uh, we have an amazing network of partners. Um, to bring a CSF offer to market, um, you know, there's, there's a whole marketing element to it, which, you know, producing videos, doing digital ads, preparing the offer document, you know, there's, there's great lawyers, accountants, um, you know, videographers, and they all need to understand that the business is raising capital as well, right? So they don't have, um, you know, a huge budget to do uh, things that, you know, other larger companies would have huge budgets for. Um, so we don't really have a formalised partnership network, but the way this has evolved, like certainly in the early days, you know, our accountants at, at Blue Rock um, and some of the law firms that we worked with at the start, they're actually instrumental to the growth of the regime because this was the first time that it had been done. So, you know, approaches to um, what a company constitution needed to look like and, you know, just a variety of things that just needed to be solved. People needed to do the work and, and think about these things and put them in place and, and then these things have become like standard practice. Um, but there are so many more opportunities that um, we haven't been able to take, but it's exciting that we're about to, you know, start to, um, to do them. But um, partnerships, um, you know, a couple that we're looking at at the moment, um, it's, uh, you know, by working together, um, you can see how it just... It shortcuts uh, so many of the things, so much of the real estate, the ground that you would otherwise need to cover. So, um, but again, it's all about relationships and people. And um, we've felt that it was important, particularly for the relationships that we have with with companies that are coming to us and want recommendations. Um, that like we don't take any referral fees from any of our partners, um, and you know, every recommendation we make is because we know that the partner does good work and um, that's been really important to, to us and, and that's built trust in, you know, putting people forward and saying, you know, you're in good hands with, um, with, with these folks but they've been critical uh, to building this industry. I mean, you mentioned a couple of um, pretty, like, well-established brands. They're like Blue Rock, Ashurst... Um you know, like, how did you go about gaining their trust? You know, like, because they're putting a big brand on the line for an emerging brand. Like, how did you convince them to partner up with you? Um, well, Ashurst was my old law firm and um, Blue Rock, I had some um, uh, some former colleagues that, that had, had joined there. Um, so, again, relationships and building trust. Um, no one really knew me or virtual at the time, um, but... You know, I had personal relationships with those people um, and I've built, you know, from, from there. And I think that that's probably the thing that I've learned is, um, again, just being consistent in your dealings with, with people um, and being a good, a good operator, then, you know, people will want to work with you. And, yeah, like those two examples. Uh, and use your network. <laughs> Absolutely, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's something that Dom, who's the other half of Euphemia, did incredibly well in the up story, which was, you know, a, a, originally a partnership with Bendigo and Adelaide Bank because good luck trying to get an Australian banking licence unless you've got, like, 25 years up your sleeve to wait. Uh, you know, so be able to run a retail consumer banking app off the back of Bendigo and Adelaide Bank's um, licence. And what's in it for Bendigo and Adelaide Bank to partner with some tech team that they've never heard of called Ferocia? You know, like, oh, well, now we can access a target market that typically we haven't been able to access. Under 35s, historically owned by CBA, you know, um, whereas Up was able to capture that market quite quickly um, just by being absolutely customer obsessed and technology driven. And um, it was a great example of a partnership that started off as a joint venture and then a, a great story for that business who, um, you know, Dom and his business partner, Grant Thomas, went on to sell uh, that company and, and Bendigo and Adelaide Bank, their partner, um, and sort of their, their real um, sort of key into the market actually became their acquirer um, at the end of the day as well. So there's, there's lots of great examples across the fintech sector of that. Um, one last one before we move to, to Q&A, because I think we've spoken a lot about the past and, like, what you've been doing so far to date. Like, just to sort of, like, where are you going in the future? Like, what's your growth trajectory look like? 
where are you headed? Um, just really quickly, like, like where, where should we be seeing each of your businesses in the next three years? Um, Arj, I'm going to start with you. Um, the global listed market currently manages about $127 trillion of wealth. Our mission is to redirect all of that into impact. So, um, it's a small mission? Very small mission. Um, if we can get to 10% of that with our AUM, that would be great in the next 10 years, and that's what we've charted out to do. Tim? Uh, as I mentioned before, like we're chasing um, to get from a million dollars a year to $100 million a year to a billion dollars a year of impact lending, and so we're currently raising the money we need to do that journey. So by 2028, FY28 is when we want to hit the 100 million per year mark. So that's kind of where, where we're going. And we think, you know, while we're Australian based, we're based here, we think most of that is going to be Asia. Actually, that's where we see, you know, you can do $100 million of impact lending a year in Asia for the next decade and you will not touch the needs, the sides of the need that they have to, for access to capital on those markets. So that's, you might not see much of us here in Australia, but you'll see a lot of us in like Cambodia and Vietnam and you know, through, through Asian markets. Right. So we've got a top-down growth, uh, growth goal, a bottom-up growth goal. What is it for virtual? Uh, so, I mean, Birchall's a digital marketplace where companies tell stories, build communities and raise capital. And um, this is the first time that early stage businesses have been offered as an asset class at scale. And that's an incredibly exciting thing. Um, thinking about our love affair um, with, um, you know, property and, and real estate, um, you know, I just think that, you know, most young people can't afford a house, you know, they can't in invest in properties, but we imagine a future where people are starting businesses um, with more confidence that they're going to be able to get the capital they need to execute their plans or people that don't want to start a business are investing in businesses and moving it in and out of those things. And um, every asset class has a range of services around it that um, help it help it perform. We've got a really compelling solution for that primary capital piece, but we're going to need secondary trading, we're going to need infrastructure and all of these things. But, I mean, to put it simply, um, we see ourselves as the REA for startups. And uh, we're in Cremorne, we've got car sales there, we've got Seek there, REA over there. So I think we need our name on a building. So. What a goal. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, thank you. Thank you all so much. We're going to shift to Q&A. So... Um, in terms of like the, the run around, we've got a yeah, handheld mic, so just pop your hand up, we'll run it to you. So come on here, yeah, front row, perfect. Thanks. Um, I just had a question for Matt. Um, you mentioned that um, Australia is the second largest crowdfunding market, but it's not the world's second largest economy. Well, why do you think it's so prevalent here? Uh, I, I did say per capita, um, per capita, on a per capita basis, but it's... Um, um, why, why is that? It, the, um, we were the last of those four markets to put in crowdfunding legislation and um, our, the laws that we have to work with have been regarded as, as the best in the world, best in class. Um, and there are some great consumer protections available and that's really important uh, because it is a risky asset class. But what the government has done is they've said, we're okay for this asset class to be offered to retail investors. Here, here are the guardrails for that. Um, and I, th I think like that's given us the comfort to, to go hard. As long as we stay within those rules, um, then, um, um, then, then we'll be okay and, and the industry will grow. Um, but I, I also think that, um, you know, Australians, Australians are entrepreneurial people, but we just haven't had the capital to um, build all of these um, these incredible startups that are out there. And, you know, looking at the US market, equity crowdfunding really is, I think, a solution in search of a problem. It has the largest pool of venture capital on the planet. But, um, you know, there, there are some great VCs um, in Australia, but the pool of venture capital is, is so small, critically small. And... We need other sources of funding to, um, you know, not only get the funding to the uh, the people that actually have startups that need it so they can execute their plans, 
but for the others that might be imagining startups, but they're not going to because they're hearing these stories from founders that have tried it saying, I can't get the capital that I need. So um, it will have a multiplier effect. Any other questions in the audience? Yes, front row, our virtual beer uh, investor. There was some self-interest in uh, investing in beer, I have to say. Um, but I want to ask a question about how the regulatory environment um, and um, how you've made tech decisions and your time to market have been impacted. How much does you know some esoteric regulatory requirement slow you down? How much would you have needed someone to have a solution to that minutia of a problem? Um, for me, look, we, um, we built an amazing MVP. It's largely the same um, in 2018 to what we have now. We're, we're in the midst of a project to um, uh, move the platform to a new, uh, a new architecture, but our approach to development was um, I mean, we focused on the front end first, and then we built the back end um, as uh, you know, as we got more business insight. Um, I so I suppose we figured we needed to solve for the people that we couldn't kind of sit next to and help through the platform first. But we took a very, very lean approach to building the platform at the start. Um, from a regulatory perspective, it was actually really helpful. We didn't have a product in market. Some of our early competitors had businesses um, and platforms that then they needed to um, kind of factor in changes in response to these new laws, whereas the laws haven't really changed since we've, since we've launched. Um, but our need to do other things or, you know, our desire to do on other things on the platform is really what's driving our, our rebuild now um, because... You know, we didn't build it in a scalable way. We didn't have all the business insight that we have now and we had technology that was available back in 2017 when we were building it. Does that answer your question? Kind of? Yeah. yeah. Do, Cam or Ash, have you had any regulatory hiccups worth building on? Um, I think, it dip, like, like you've identified yourself, it's different in all our instances, crowdfunding regs, lending regs, investment regs. So from a retail investment reg, um, obviously you need to have the appropriate legal advice in place. Um, you can't really offer anyone a product unless you have an authorized Australian financial services license to do so or access to one that allows you to do so. But being able to do that also, it's not you can't just have any AFSL, you need a retail AFSL. Um, and ensuring you actually understand that the regulatory framework you're entering into is very important because it comes with compliance requirements that you've got to uphold all the time and finding ways to, you know, maybe not have to get do it all yourself. So, for example, there are provisions such as the enhanced regulatory sandbox in Australia, which allows you to test retail investment products up to a certain amount. I think it's $5 million of exposure um, without having to need a full AFSL. There are other arrangements such as a corporate authorized representative arrangement, um, which someone who already has an AFSL is in a position to grant funds to that company. But you can have two AFSLs. Really, understanding which environment is best for the people to be in, and then having the appropriate legal advice to then pursue it in terms of how much it sets you back. I don't think the regulation is set you back in terms of being able to launch a product. Knowing what they are allows you to plan on the how to do much more things that you prepare for, and what you don't do in the end of the Fair point. It's one of the reasons why. Um, Euphemia, we think there's a role for a dedicated fintech firm in the region um, because there are just extra regulatory hurdles that a fintech has to cross, you know, to be able to get to product market fit and then to be able to get to scale and then to be able to protect that compliance with the growing complexity as a business grows. And so um, at the moment, like for every dollar that a B2B SaaS or an e-commerce company might need, to get to the same milestone, a fintech, you know, in some instances has to spend three. Uh, and so we find that, you know, a, a check size for a fintech just doesn't get you as far 
as a check size. Because yes, you have to get legal advice and you have to get good legal advice, which can cost money. You know, or you have to just take more time to understand your environment, move a little bit more slowly. And so we find that the fintech profile from an investor point of view is just a little bit more like similar to med tech or, or health tech. You know, um, it's, it's similar in terms of the pace you should expect and the capital requirements of a lot of those businesses. So um, that's something we're trying to, to, to build um, is a dedicated fintech fund for the region. And there's an added uh, constraint of uh, a lot of the VC funds in Australia will have, um, you know, uh, ESV CLP, uh, so early stage venture capital limited partnership um, status, which is like a tax benefit. Um, so if you invest in that fund that has ESV CLP status, you get a bit of a tax break um, because you're investing in an early stage company um, and the government, you know, wants you to do that. And so you get a little bit of a tax benefit for doing so. Um, but there are some rules around ESV CLP when it comes to fintech. Um, not all fintech is off bounds, but a lot of fintech is off bounds. And so what that means is that there are a lot of funds in Australia that get ESV CLP status. And then it means that there are a lot of fintechs that go underfunded because they can't be funded by those funds. So there's a funding gap, there's a funding need, um, and we'd love to direct more capital because we don't have enough to do it all. So we need to unlock some more funding um, into the sector. But uh, anyway, Can I'll I add my soap bo soapbox. <laughs> Thank you for adding that. I think... Um our, our approach is perhaps very non-traditional and perhaps controversial in the sense that when we, part of the reason why when we launched in 2018, it's took us a long time to get to market is we spent a lot of time going down some rabbit holes talking. We spent a lot of time, 18 months in fact, in a deep dive with Bendigo Bank as for going, okay, great, we can do this part, you can do that part. We've got a shared objective here around community sector banking and blah, blah. You can take care of then of all the regulatory stuff and whatever and we can do this. We got 18 months into that and then that fell over. Then we had a similar conversation with NAB and we kind of went down that path. And then eventually we went, you know what, this is dumb because banks are just not set up to do what we want to do. Like we actually want lenders and borrowers talking to each other. So we went, okay, let's go out. And so we went and got some legal advice and spoke to a whole bunch of ASIC regulators and we spoke with ASIC and we talked about what we're doing and all that kind of stuff. And eventually we went, okay, where we need to go is fintech and probably what we need to do is more crypto Web3, DeFi, I mean, Web3 didn't exist at that point we are talking about it, but we need to go into this kind of new world because, again, looking to the future, we went, well, we think by the time we get to any kind of scale, the things that we'll need will be built and they'll be those tools, not the current tools that are in the market and available. And we need to know and have a guess what that regulatory regime is going to be because that's the one that we want to comply with eventually and we want you to spend the money. So as a director group, I guess we kind of looked at our legal advice and everything and we, we made a decision like we're too early to go out and start. We don't even know if we've got a business that will work yet um, and we're not Australian like in, in the sense of our lender group and our borrower group are not necessarily Australian. So we went, well, we can go through a process of getting a car and we spoke to some people around that but they're like, well, we can cover this part of your business but all of this part that is non-Australian lenders and non-Australian borrowers, like that falls outside of our responsibility. We don't feel comfortable about that. So we had to make some decisions as to, well, if we want to pursue the objective we do, what do we comply with? So we looked at the CSF regulation, we looked at what's happening globally and went, well, the key things that are important is KYC AML, understanding who beneficial owners are, that we have contracts and agreements between that. And so we went, what are all the things that we think are important from the regulatory environment and what are the tools we've got? And when we're working globally, people understand contract law. And again, the legal advice we got was, if you do things this way, then you can get by with contract law and you fall outside of stuff. Because there's nothing stopping me sending money and lending money to any person I want in Cambodia, right? I can just send the money, sign a contract and we're good to go. It's unregulated, right? And so we just went, we, we navigated this and again, look, you know, again, at some point there are aspects of our product and things we want to do that will tip into the regulatory environment. But the one that we're watching in order to comply with is what we hope is going to be a better synthesized global system of regulation around how DeFi assets work so that we can have a platform where any person can plug their digital wallet in and a smart contract will pull it and put it in someone else's digital wallet and they're responsible for what happens in those countries in terms of tax and whatever else, but we've got a regime. Now, that's also meant we've had to look at it and go, well, we're Australian-based now. 
but we don't care if we have to move. If we have to go to Singapore and like their regulatory environment around crypto is definitely looking like it's going to be far better than Australia, like we may re-domicile or create a venture there and like and then we become subservient, whatever. So we are, we've been slowed down a lot. We've t- paid a bunch of money for advice around what to do. And then we have made risk-based calculations as a director group as to what we'll comply with, what we don't, what we'll put in place, where we're shooting for what we're building later versus what we're building now. And, you know, we just communicate clearly through all of our documentation, taking on board what CSF does, says this is, you know, you've ticked multiple times that you are assuming all the risk and you understand that you are putting money directly into, you know, it's between you and the borrower. It's got nothing to do with us as a platform. We're no part of it. So we've kind of learnt from a whole bunch of the regulation and designed something that we feel we can defend, but we haven't gone down the path yet of saying, spending the money that we would have to spend to have an AFSL in Australia because, again, it doesn't solve our problem. It's not going to help the lender I've got in Guatemala invest in the business in Africa if I've got an AFSL here. Like, it's just, it's irrelevant, right? So for us, why would I spend the money on that? It's not, it's, you know, that kind of goes against our director responsibilities about how we spend our money from a business. So it's been, it's every day we think about it but yeah, we don't have a good solution yet. But you know, when we do secondary markets and people can sell their to- like all that's regulated, right? So again, it influences your product roadmap of what you can do when, I think, as we're watching this global, hopefully some global harmonization around how this DeFi stuff's gonna work. We don't know, but we're making a bet on that, I guess. Yeah, awesome. I know we had a question up the back before. Yes. Hi there. Um, I had a question for Matt, but um, I actually, Judy, you might have uh, some good insights into this, which is really around unintended consequences uh, for your for your borrowers. So I come out of the impact space, and um, now I'm over on the capital side, working in VC, and some of my colleagues on that side um, say, "Oh no, no, I wouldn't touch something that had that had done crowd equity. They've got, you know, they just couldn't raise in real ways, or uh, their cap table's messy." So I'm really curious. You know, so when I was working, doing the kinds of stuff, you know, in the spaces that Cam's working in, no problem. Get your money any way you can. <laughs> um, when you're looking at companies that may want to raise in other ways later down the line, have you seen, how has this played out? Do you have any, do you have any insight into that? Um, the, the, the stigma um, or of, of raising with crowdsource funding. I, yeah, it's... Um, I mean, I think it's a myth, and and it's been like it's been busted many times now. Um, there are companies that have been invested in by C- by VCs that have come and raised on our platform. There are VCs that have invested in our platform. Um, there are VCs that have invested subsequent to a company doing a CSF offer. Um, a lot of the concerns, the governance arrangements, having lots of investors, um, it can be dealt with by having the right governance arrangements in place. So, you know, this is the, the work that I was referring to, the thinking on, okay, um, the government set up a regime where the, you know, company makes an offer and will end up with literally hundreds or thousands of shareholders and they'll still be a proprietary limited company. So how do they need to organise themselves? The way they do that is often terminate the shareholders' deed if they've got one and put in place a constitution that's not quite a public company constitution because it doesn't have, you know, takeovers rules and you can still have drag and tag along rights, but um, it won't have, you know, it, it'll be drafted on the basis that you're going to have more than, you know, 50 shareholders, which most small proprietary limited companies do have. Um and this is an exercise that every company goes through before they make an offer, certainly on our platform. Like that is one of the things that we make absolutely sure is we don't give them the advice on the constitution, but we say like if these are the principles that you need to think about. You're going to end up with thousands of shareholders. Are you comfortable with how you've organised your company? So I think a lot of these questions and the stigma can be dealt with just by logic, just saying the company will look different, but your rights are still protected and these are where, you know, um, these things will belong now. Um, naturally, though, it does make a lot of investors that are, you know, familiar with the old way a bit uncomfortable because um, a lot of the things that they they will seek um, 
will often already be in there in the suite of documents that companies prepare, like preference rights and all, you know, liquidation preferences and all of these things that VCs and professional investors, they love just having on the table. Companies need to ask to have them removed. But, um, you know, this is a scenario, not by design, just by, by practicality, that if larger investors want a better deal, um, they need to they need to ask for it and they need to demonstrate you know the value that they're going to provide if a company's been through a crowdsource funding process naturally that makes some people feel uncomfortable but um it, it, this will change over time yeah my only build on that is that it's yeah definitely a sign of the maturity of the venture uh landscape in australia and i i, I share share matt's views that we just need the passage of time and those deals to mature and, and show the the liquidity outcomes um and I think it's also just a sign of the changing power dynamics between founders and investors, you know. Um, the, the ball has been on the side of the investor for many, many years. Um, we saw it starting to move into the founders court quite heavily um, until this recent sort of bust. Um, and it's just temporarily, I think, gone back into investors' hands. But, like, overall, if you zoom out far enough, those power dynamics are changing and founders are getting much more intelligent. And the ecosystem, like, not intelligent in general. I mean, into experienced on, like, you know, like the, the, what it takes, you know, to raise capital and what the different options look like um, and that it just doesn't have to be the VC train. It can be a little bit of equity. It can be, uh, sorry, a little bit of equity crowdfunding, a little bit of VC, a little bit of debt. You know, like there's lots of ways to inject money into your business to grow your company. Um, and like the, a lot of the barriers, because like we come up against them all the time. Like we invest directly in companies and we invest in VC funds and we've invested in virtual, like, you know, we've invested in debt funds. We're in a bit of everything. And, like, those bad terms, messy cap tables, you know, um, like, bad, bad, you know, preferences and things, like, they exist in any deal, regardless of whether they've come from, like, can, can, can show up anywhere. So, um, yeah, I think, I think we'll see a shift over time. Um, we had a question over here. Yes. We've got five uh, crowdfunding uh, instruments. We've got two early stage venture capitals. We've got, and what we've done is broken up into thin slices. We've got seed specifically, this is the criteria. We've got scale specifically, this is the criteria. And also with the early stage venture capital, we've got specific criteria that you need to qualify to get into that. So my question is, I'm currently in the ESSEC uh, Innovation Hub sandbox. Uh, they say jump, I say how high? <laughs> and uh, so I'm just looking if any advice I can get. Who's been in the higher sandbox before? <laughs> we, we, we definitely looked at it. Um, I think it, it, it changes. And I think you know, we, we, we spoke to a bunch of people that had used it and we spoke to a bunch of other people that were outside it. We made a call not to use it because we felt it would be too constrictive for us and, and the amount that we wanted to do in our, in our commercial model. So I have no experience in it. I just guess we looked at it and went, that seems hard and that seems constraining and your experience of how high do you want to jump, that kind of what is what it kind of felt like. And so we went, ah, no, let's not do that. So all power to you for jumping in, I think, is kind of what I'm going to say. But I mean, Arj, you, you, you've you had a look at it too, I think. Yeah, had a look at it chose not to do it, um, <laughs> similar, similar story. I think it's built, it's built for very niche purposes, um, which are good, but it's a great place to test stuff. So if you have it, I know they will ask you to jump high, but do everything you can to test everything you want to test because that's the point of it. And that was the directive we got when we got our advice and we wanted to do it that if – if there is a part of building a fintech where you can fail and not get crucified for it, it's probably the sandbox. So test your stuff there because you'll know what'll work and what won't work very quickly. Um, and that'll then help you establish the base you need for your formal licensing in the next stage. Uh, it's also just, it doesn't last long enough because if you're a startup building something, three years, one and a half is just to maybe set things up to test all the different variations of your product, your customer, your tech. It, I, I just feel like it doesn't, it should last longer than it currently does, so yeah. 
My only alternative bill for the sandbox is, um, again, I feel like I'm telling all of dumb stories, but I've just heard them all so many times. They feel like my own. But, um, you know, I think, again, like what Up did a really great job. They were the first ever bank to be um, hosted by Google Cloud. Um, you know, like not in servers with physical warehouses and everything on Australian soil. Like, you know, Google's Google's servers are all over the place, you know. Um, and so that was something new for the regulators because, you know, we wanted to be in the, like the bank wanted to be in the cloud because they can move faster, they can, like all this, like a continuous deployment, not once a day, once an hour, more, like several times an hour in terms of the deployments they can roll out in the app. And so um, they actually had to invite the regulators in to demonstrate how it works. And like, you know, so they were playing more of an educator role, like being truly disruptive and truly ahead of the curve of regulation. You're basically bringing the regulators in and saying like, we want to be safe. This is how it's safe. We can still be in the cloud and still have servers outside of Australia and be secure. Let us show you how in 30 seconds we can switch all the servers to Australian servers if something goes wrong. And they were doing live demos and having Q&A and invited them in. And so, um, you know, uh, the up team ended up create like legislation was created off the back of those demos. And then all of these other digital banks that came after UP was able to benefit from them. So it also also just depends like how, where do you want to be on that innovator's curve? You know, do you want to be a, a follower of someone else's hard work and then you can run fast? Or do you want to be the one who's breaking the back with the regulators? It's another approach you can take. Thanks. Yeah. Any other questions before, oh, sorry, Matt, do you have a uh, comment? Look, I'd just add to that, um, I, and th that's a great story because, you know, um, Building a good relationship with a regulator is really important, particularly if you can need a license. Um, I like kind of share your concerns or frustrations with the sandbox. I think it's like a hundred retail clients that you're limited to as well. Like it's it's not a, it's a good initiative, but it's probably not useful enough. Um, but just think, every touch point you have with a regulator. Um, is like is relevant to your future relationship, and don't like don't be nervous about it. Like sure, they say jump, you say how high, but it's more about just building a relationship. Because to Judy's point, like there will be things at times that you will know more about than they will, and you want to build a constructive relationship where you can have a conversation. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of soft soft skills in that. So being close to ASIC, it's a great opportunity to start building relationships. We're, uh, we're actually out of time. Um, I'd love to keep going, but uh, uh, just really quickly, if, if anyone in the audience um, did have a question that they didn't get a chance to ask or maybe they ruminate on some of the things you say and have a question later, um, just quickly for each of you, what's the best way to find you? Um, Ash, Link, LinkedIn. Okay. LinkedIn. Yeah, uh, yeah LinkedIn or, or email, matt at virtual.com. Perfect. Um, so just quickly a little summary we've heard, um, you know, Impact has its own meaning to each business and we're, we're keeping it kind of broad. There's no universal definition for, uh, you know, fintech for impact. So, you know, I think you've got to just got to um, remember that ESG doesn't equal impact. That's like a really clear takeaway from everyone. Um, when it comes to trust, like it's building slowly over time, doing what you say, you know, being consistent. And when you don't have time, uh, just making sure that you've got the faces and, and try and leverage your personal brand and your personal trust if your company doesn't have that yet. In terms of partnerships, just recognising you can't do it alone, you know, um, and you don't have to. Uh, so, you know, um, Aj made a great point about partners and services and when to toggle between you're a partner and you're a service provider um, and, and treating those relationships like special coins to dole out. Um, and that, like, with partnerships, again, it's all about people and trust and, and don't be afraid to use your network. You never know, you know, a previous job or a previous boss might be a supporter, you know, of your next venture. Um in terms of growth, everyone had a really big vision. You know, like, I want my name in lights next to the greatest. I want the entire market to switch. And we want to get to a billion, like, it has to end in a B, you know. Like, so some really, really big growth ambitions, you know, regardless of what stage you're at. Like, everyone is trying to shoot the lights out, um, you know. And, and it was also just really clear in that Q&A discussion that Australia clearly has a pretty rich regulatory environment. And whilst building a fintech is bloody hard, like, you can have a huge impact. Like, not just in the way that we've been talking about impact, but money changes people's lives. And money is a part of the system in which we operate as a society, and it changes things. It moves markets. It builds products and services. It creates jobs. Like, it does so many things. And so it's a really interesting space to be working in, a really 
worthwhile space to be working in, in, in my opinion. And so whilst there are challenges and it is really hard to cross that chasm um, as a fintech, like it's an incredible, so I've got so much respect, you know, for, for entrepreneurs working in the fintech space because it's not easy, um, but the rewards can be massive. Um, so uh, yeah, please put your hands together and join me in thanking Matt, Cam and Ash. Um, thank you so much for coming and um, over to you. Yes, well, what a